Well, hello, I'm Martin Green speaking to you from Sydney. I'm with the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and it's an honour to be able to speak to you today on the history and future of the photovoltaics industry. We can imagining, imagine the industry starting with the demonstration of the first efficient silicon solar cell at Bell Labs in 1954. There was much excitement, um, you know, with this discovery, um, made front page news in the New York Times. A vast power of the sun is tapped by a battery using sand ingredient. And there was all kinds of hope for the way this technology might be used, as you can see the family there looking at the solar panel. But unfortunately, the solar cells were far too expensive for any application apart from the use in space. And uh, this was discovered when solar cells were launched on the fourth satellite to go up, the second US one, Vanguard 1, and they performed exceptionally well. So when the first communication satellite was contemplated, Telstar 1, in 1962, solar cells were an obvious choice for powering the satellite. And uh, Bell Labs again uh, were tasked with the job of developing reliable solar cells for that application. And the design that they came up with um, is shown there, a two centimetre by two centimetre cell with six fingers. Um, and that design uh, remained around for the next uh, decade or more. Uh, it was known as the conventional space cell when I joined the industry in the early 1970s. Uh, in 1968, uh, ComSat Lab was set up to uh, improve the technology used in satellites. And one of the technologies selected for improvement was the solar cells. And Joseph Lindsmeyer had the job of leading a group that looked at ways of doing this. And they analysed the of conventional cell design and came up with some limitations and produced the violet cell, which was the first big improvement for about a decade. As you can see on the chart there at the bottom, that's showing the efficiency versus timeline, um, you know, with a big um, gap in the period when there was any performance increase. Um, Joseph left to, set, left to set up SolarX, you know, one of the early um, major players in the industry. Uh, but at ComSat, they pushed on and they developed what was known as the black cell by adding uh, anisotropic texturing to the cell. This was a technique already being used in microelectronics, but the random pyramids that were created uh, for the solar cells was something new, and that gave a big jump in performance. So something close to 17% under terrestrial conditions, about 15% under space radiation. Um, you can see the diagram of the black cell there. Also, um, you know, slightly earlier, aluminium alloying had been used to form a heavily doped region near the rear of the cell, known as the back surface field. And um, also in 1974, Spectralab um, described screen printing as a low-cost method for um, producing the metallization on the cells. So um, combining the black cell with this low-cost way of applying the metal by screen printing silver and aluminium paste, um, the aluminium back surface field cell was born. And this was a very successful technology which dominated the industry for the next 40 years. Uh, about the same time, I was doing my PhD at McMaster University in Canada where I'd won a scholarship to. And uh, my job was to look at applications of a tunneling structure, what we call an MIS tunneling structure. And one of the applications I identified early in my thesis was replacing P injunctions. I showed if you design this MIS contact correctly, you could get uh, identical properties to an ideal P injunction diode. Um, so uh, I looked at ways that you might be able to exploit that property and energy conversion was one of them. And it so happened my supervisor had a project electron voltaics rather than photovoltaics using electrons to excite the carriers. And um, these MIS structures completely outperformed um, all the other PN junction type devices that were made. So an early demonstration of, uh, you know, a passivated contact, you know, so I guess it was really a tunneling oxide passivated contact. So the first of these and the graph down there at the bottom just shows the performance compared to a PN junction under electron illumination. And uh, the voltage corresponds to about 650 millivolts at uh, one sun. 
So uh, quite respectable cells for that era using these passivated contacts. I joined the University of New South Wales in 1974 and um, uh, continued work with this uh, MIS replacement for PN junctions in photovoltaics. But the other idea I came across was, you know, replacing the back surface field by a tunneling structure as well. So just a low work function contact for one of the contacts and a high work function for the other. And you should get this um, double heterojunction structure that I call the MISM structure. So I was really delighted when I discovered this. I thought this has got to be the ultimate photovoltaic technology, which it probably is. And, uh, you know, very similar to the um, heterojunction transistors that, uh, you know, are leading the world today in terms of their overall performance. So, um, you know, the present Topcon uses polycrystalline silicon. So we investigated that as well, actually in 1981. You know, and the reason was, you know, we realized these MIS structures were very sensitive to temperature. You know, anything over 300 degrees centigrade would kill them, you know, a bit like a heterojunction cell today, I guess. But um, uh, we we um, realized that if we use polycrystalline silicon for the contact rather than metal, we could get similar properties and um, they, they would survive the high temperatures required in screen printing. So the chart on the right there just sort of shows how well we were doing with these Topcon structures, you know, back in that era. So we, we um, NASA had a program to improve cell efficiency by improving voltage, and we beat all the NASA contractors in terms of the voltages that we could get using these tunneling structures, um, and um, got up very close to 700 millivolts in 1982. And with the um, first polysilicon Topcon structure, we got 660 plus type voltages, were, which were a record outside our group, as you can see from that uh, chart. Um, you know, we pushed on converting these um, uh, high voltages to high efficiency, and our first success was in 1983 where we got our first world record for silicon cell, cell efficiency. In fact, the first 18% efficient cell, and this is its structure here. So it used a um, tunneling MIS structure as the top contact, so a low recombination velocity or a passivated contact for the top contact. And um, that gave us our first world record, and you can see the team there that produced that cell. Uh, just a at the same time, you know, while we were testing these tunneling devices, we realized that we might be able to get a similar result just by going to a small area contact, which is something I had suggested uh, several years earlier as so another way of passivating the contact area of the cells, you know, quite a simple way, I guess. Um, and we incorporated that in our second world record, which was, which was the first 19% efficient cell. I realized just a couple of months after our 18% efficient device, and we replaced the tunneling structure in it just by a small area contact. So as I said, 1983 was a very big year for us. And um, when, um, you know, already suggested a double heterojunction structure as a way of fixing up the front and the rear of the cell. But um, I, I also um, suggested in that year that we could use small area contacts on the rear. And I drew my first diagram of a PERC solar cell in 1983 for a couple of reports I had to prepare at the end of that year. And uh, that's the original diagram that you can see there. So again, using small area contacts on the rear to get that low um, recombination effect at the metal contacts. Um, so using um, the earlier structure, the um, the uh, what we call the pest structure, just the low area contact on the top, we got our first 20% efficiency cell, you know, just by texturing it. It was all we needed to push it over the 20% mark. And we got above 21% with the same structure. And then uh, Stanford University interrupted our run of records. The only interruption we had over 31 years, <laughs> in fact. But they uh, reported on their um, interdigitated back contact solar cell. So they were using small area contacts as well uh, in that structure. Uh, for different reasons originally. You know, we were doing thermo photovoltaics and it was needed for that structure. But it uh, worked very well in terms of recombination velocity and they got the first 22% efficient cell with that structure in 1988. That pushed us into getting the perk working 
and with a bit of help from Stanford, a few clues from them about how we might go about it, we managed to make the first 23% efficient cell in 1989 and went on to make the first 24% in 94 and then uh, 25% in 1999. And that 25% was a record that stood for 15 years until 2014. Um, You know, this is just what happened um, after our run of records. So you can see the red um, diamonds, uh, our efficiency run extending over 31 years, interrupted for six months by Stanford. And then you can see all these other technologies starting to catch up to where Perk got to. So um, uh, first there was the uh, IBC cell, uh, with um, um, sun power being the main uh, advocate of that technology, and then the heterojunction cell with Sanyo um, being the main proponent of that, showing very similar to developmental uh, trajectories, getting close to 25% around 2014. But the uh, interdigitated back contact using amorphous silicon contacts um, you know, originally by Panasonic, got over 25%, the first cell to exceed that limit, and Kanika took it over 26%. So they held the record for first over 26%. And um, and then the heterojunction cell has recently uh, moved onwards with um, uh, Longi recently getting to 268 So they look like they may, may be the first to get over 27% in terms of cell efficiency. So we have these four contending technologies, um, you know, the PERC and the PERC with passivated contact, also known as TopCon, uh, as the uh, other contender, heterojunctions, and then the interdigitated back contact, either using, um, I guess, PERC or TopCon or heterojunction contacts <laughs> or a combination of all of them uh, as the candidate. Um, so um, this just shows the market share of the different technologies with the BSF, the blue and maroon regions dominating until about 2018 when the PERC, the brown and the yellow region, started taking over. And just last year, we saw a lot of activity with uh, TopCon in particular, the orange region at the top there, and it's going to have even more impact during uh, 2023. And where are we going ultimately? I think it has to be some type of tandem cell structure. You know, initially on silicon, just to um, make uh, market entry sufficiently uh, straightforward. Um, So, you know, a cell stacked onto silicon, maybe two cells onto silicon that can take the efficiency from, you know, 25% type values up to, you know, possibly over 41%. Um, The main problem is finding materials to stack onto silicon that has all the desirable attributes like abundancy, non-toxicity, stability, as well as efficiency. And I've listed the contenders there, and none of them tick all four boxes. So it's still a work in progress trying to find a material uh, for a tandem. So I think, uh, you know, if you stack one cell on silicon, that's an ideal market entry point, and then you may as well add the second cell because it doesn't require too much extra to do that. But every time you add a cell to the silicon, you divide the contribution of the silicon cell by the number of cells in the stack. So with a four cell stack, you'd only get a quarter of the power output from silicon that it'd give by itself. So you might well ask, you know, what's the point of silicon, particularly if you validated these other materials through terawatt production quantities. So I think a future lies in a multiple stack thin film. So looking at the industry, I think the modern industry was started by this man here, uh, Dr. Zhengrong Shi, my uh, 12th PhD student. So you can see uh, in the graph the cost reductions that have uh, occurred since 2008, which I attributed to his initiatives. So I won't have time to go over it in this talk, but the five separate regions that you can attribute the cost reduction to, but the big dramatic cost reductions at the beginning there are due to Zhengrong's desire to start manufacturing in China, which had no none of the required infrastructure at that point in time. So he set up his first line in 2002, and that's me at the opening ceremony cutting the ribbon, and with a bit of help from other people from our group and everything, that was a very successful initiative. Um, His progress was noted by some of the US investment banks, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, and he listed in 2005, it was the biggest technology float of the year, a huge success, which not only set Zhang up well, but it encouraged investment banks in the US 
and other wannabe um, photovoltaic in manufacturers in China to come together and repeat Zhengrong's fundraising efforts. So between 2005 and 2010, there was over $7 billion raised from U.S. investors by these listings on U.S. exchanges. And I've shown the first six less, uh, listings there. Five of them had people from our group heavily involved, as you can see from those circle. So uh, if you look at the 10 companies that listed over that period, um, six of the 10 were in the top 10 worldwide still in uh, 2021. So sort of forming the backbone of the industry. So I've just listed them there in their rankings. So, um, you know, what's happened since? Well, we've, we've seen uh, China completely dominate the industry. So this is just showing different components of the industry. And China is the blue share. The rest of the world is the yellow share. So we can see how China is um, now dominating all areas of activity. And down the bottom left, you can see the installation. Blue again is China. Other countries colored in different countries. But again, China has been the major player in the uptake of solar, which has been very important reducing the amount of CO2 emission from, from China. And then on the right there, you can just sort of see, this is all from PV Tech, this information, but you can see, see their analysis, you know, we're entering a new era now. So we, you know, previously it was um, demand limited the, the photovoltaic market, but we're entering the supply limited regime. So this may give uh, the, the opportunity for manufacturing to diversify a bit now that uh, low cost you know, may not be the critical um, selling point in, uh, in selling photovoltaic modules. So thank you very much for your attention.